People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say because it's total crap. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Watch Mojo. Today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 marketing fails. Sweeter, bolder, better. You're insane. Delicious tasting AIDS candy contains vitamins and minerals, no drugs. If I give this to you, are you up for whatever happens next? Uh, for this list, we're looking at advertising campaigns or statements from major corporations that backfired horribly, resulting in tons of negative press. Can you think of any other marketing blunders? Be sure to use the comments below to tell us about your favorites. All right, let's get into it. Number 20, Live For Now, Pepsi. Titled Live For Now, this short film slash commercial sees Kendall Jenner parting a protest like some kind of miraculous savior. By giving a can of Pepsi to a police officer, she unites them all using the power of soft drinks. The ad generated immediate criticism and was pulled just one day after its debut. Many critics argued that it insensitively borrowed elements from the Black Lives Matter movement, trivializing the protests and very real issues in the process. Others claimed that Pepsi was utilizing social justice causes for their own commercial benefit. Even Bernice King got in on the bashing, saying, quote, if only daddy would have known about the power of hashtag Pepsi. Number 19, an illegal weapon as a giveaway, electronic arts. Producers of violent video games are always having to defend themselves from parent groups that claim that such entertainment makes impressionable young minds similarly violent. When EA sent out a pair of commemorative but functional brass knuckles along with early press copies of Godfather 2, they really gave the naysayers an easy argument. Worse than being bad for PR, this stunt was actually illegal, given that brass knuckles are banned outright in many states. You can appreciate that EA was getting into the spirit of their property, but the distribution of contraband weaponry via mail isn't something a company wants on their rap sheet. They quickly asked that the knuckles all be returned. Number 18, all I want for Xmas is a PSP.com, Sony. It can often be embarrassing when corporations try to relate to young people. In December of 2006, the website all I want for Christmas is a PSP.com appeared. PSP, PSP, PSP. It was said to be a fan blog following the adventures of Charlie, who was attempting to get his friend Jeremy a PSP for Christmas. The blog featured your stereotypical hipster tweens, complete with deliberate misspellings like beats with a Z. You know, to relate to all the cool kids. Come on, mom and dad, get one for me. Visitors to the site immediately smelled something fishy and left some nasty comments, resulting in Charlie asking, quote, Yo, where all you haters come from? The site's URL was quickly tracked to an ad agency, and Sony was forced to admit their ploy, asking, quote, Maybe our speech was a little too funky fresh. How do you do, fellow kids? What? Number 17, the endless crab fiasco, Red Lobster. Don't offer up an all-you-can-eat special on a popular and typically pricey item unless you've triple-checked your calculations. Restaurants typically advertise doorbuster specials knowing that whatever the giveaway is, they'll turn a profit on the complimentary products they move. In the case of this 2003 Red Lobster promotion, however, someone grossly underestimated American appetites for crustaceans. Crab lovers took their seats and proceeded to order plate after plate of the stuff. By the third serving, the restaurant was in the red. By the fourth, significantly so. That man ate all our shrimp and two plastic lobsters. Tis no man. Tis a remorseless eating machine. Arr. By the end of a promotion lasting several months, Red Lobster had lost roughly $3.3 million, hanking the parent company's stock value. President Edna Morris stepped down. Number 16, New Look, Holiday Inn. In 1997, Holiday Inn was spending a collective $1 billion to upgrade its numerous facilities. The best way to get that information across to the public? According to someone in marketing, by comparing it to a post-op trans woman. This Super Bowl commercial depicts men ogling an attractive woman at a class reunion. New nose, $6,000. Lips, $3,000. New chest, $8,000. The narrator lists off the prices for the woman's surgical work before man realizes that he's talking to an old male classmate. The narrator concludes, Imagine what Holiday Inns will look like when we spend a billion. The ad received backlash, and the company was forced to pull it from the air, saying, quote, We understand that the ad has offended some people. That was never our intention. 
Number 15, hashtag my NYPD photo campaign, NYPD. The relationship between police and the public in the United States remains fraught, with instances of police brutality coming under increasing scrutiny. In 2014, the NYPD decided to address the bad PR by asking people to tweet images of their interactions with police using the hashtag MyNYPD. Unsurprisingly, this was an absolute disaster of epic proportions. Within hours, users flooded Twitter with photos of police brutality, including many taken during the Occupy Wall Street protests. Frankly, you have to wonder how they didn't see this coming. The hashtag went viral in all the worst ways possible. Number 14, the world's largest popsicle melts. Snapple. Clean up on aisle three, and by that we mean Manhattan's Union Square. In 2005, Snapple decided to go big in the promotional stunt department for their new icy treats. 25 feet tall and 171.5 tons big to be precise. Aiming to set a world record, they constructed a monolithic popsicle and then attempted to unveil it before the public in downtown New York. But first, it had to be transported from Edison, New Jersey on a hot summer's day. And sure enough, as anyone who's ever eaten a popsicle could have predicted, it melted. The grand unveiling was more a torrent of sticky juice, one that firefighters had to be called in to wash away. Number 13, making the CEO's social security number public, LifeLock. It's one thing to put your money where your mouth is, but your identity and personal security? That's too much to gamble in any situation. That's my real social security number. Nevertheless, in a well-intentioned but wildly inadvisable PR stunt, Todd Davis, the CEO of LifeLock, which offers protection against identity theft, put his social security number on the company website, claiming that thanks to his company's products, it didn't matter. In the only possible outcome, Davis was promptly defrauded by criminals who were only too willing to prove the man wrong. Not once, but a reported 13 times. This spectacular failure naturally undermined people's faith in the company, which was fined millions for deceptive advertising. I didn't steal his identity. I literally got, got it off the back of a truck. Number 12, hashtag Susan Album Party, Susan Boyle. Remember when Susan Boyle took the world by storm with her rendition of I Dreamed a Dream? I dreamed a dream in time gone by. Well, that eventually led to a contract and multiple studio albums, including 2012's Standing Ovation, The Greatest Songs from the Stage. In a joke straight out of Arrested Development, Boyle's PR team decided to plug the album with the hashtag Susan Album Party. It was an unfortunate choice of phrasing as many people on social media hilariously read it as Sue's Anal Bum Party. I won't cry, no, I won't shed a tear. The hashtag trended on Twitter, with many people playing along and providing jokes on their own. Let that be a lesson to PR teams everywhere. Number 11, the Windows 98 demo, Microsoft Corporation. Before you show off a fancy new toy, you should make sure that it actually, you know, works. Unfortunately, Bill Gates and Microsoft product manager Chris Capicella were left scrambling on stage when the operating system decided to tap out during a presentation. You'll notice that this scanner build, whoa. <laughs> While demonstrating Windows 98 at Comdex, Capicella plugged a scanner into the PC, resulting in the widely feared blue screen of death. The audience laughed, clapped, and cheered in good humor, while Capicella and Gates awkwardly smiled along, not really knowing what to do or how to react. Moving that right must, along. That must be, uh... They played it off well, with Gates even providing a cheeky little joke. That must be why we're not shipping Windows 98 yet. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Number 10, the Touch Woody PC and its equally laughable advertising, Panasonic. Back in the 1990s, when personal computing was still finding its footing, Panasonic managed to come up with possibly the worst name in marketing possible. In an attempt to emphasize the user-friendly nature of this new Japanese computer, they licensed the Woody Woodpecker character to be used as not only the mascot, but the computer's namesake as well. Meet the Woody. Oh, but wait, it gets worse. Because it boasted a touchscreen, the Japanese company put out early promotional materials with the tagline, Touch Woody, the Internet Pecker. Seriously, we couldn't make this stuff up. <laughs> Once they realized their mistake, they made some last minute changes, but Woody touchscreen isn't much better. Number nine, free flights, Hoover. Though it's hard to fathom in hindsight, back in the early 90s, 
someone at Hoover thought it would be a good deal to offer free flights to British customers who bought 100 British pounds, somewhere around 175 US dollars in 1992 worth of their products. Two return flight seats. Unbelievable. At first, the flights were limited to within Europe. But in a move that resulted in things really getting out of hand, the company eventually added US destinations. The money people had to spend was a fraction of a normal ticket price. And so people bought vacuums just for the trip. I was shocked that they would run a promotional activity where they were only asking a consumer to spend £100 to gain a reward of up to £600. Utterly overwhelmed by the results, Hoover backed out of its promise, fired executives, and lost tens of millions of dollars. Number eight, AIDS, the Carly Company. For decades, this product enjoyed healthy sales, its popularity peaking in the 70s to early 80s. Delicious tasting AIDS candy contains vitamins and minerals, no drugs. Coming in a wide variety of sweet flavors, AIDS was widely touted and marketed as an appetite suppressant. The manufacturer could not have predicted the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s, but the connections were immediately made. I've tried fad diets, powders, pills, still my weight's been up and down like a yo-yo, until the AIDS plan taught me how to take off weight and help keep it off. It also didn't help the product's case that significant weight loss is a symptom of the disease. And it's really unfortunate that the company had actors and models claiming, quote, the AIDS diet plan really works. And I'm not gaining weight. I'm losing weight deliciously with the aid of AIDS. The AIDS diet plan really worked. By the late 80s, sales of AIDS had dropped 50%, and the candy was eventually taken off the market. Number seven, KKK Wednesday, Krispy Kreme Donuts Incorporated. Sometimes an idea is just so baffling and obviously problematic that it's a wonder no one caught it earlier. This is one of those cases. Back at it again at Krispy Kreme. To cash in on children being out of school, a Krispy Kreme franchise in Hull, England created a promotion titled KKK Wednesday. It was meant to stand for Krispy Kreme Club Wednesday, but people obviously connected it to the Ku Klux Klan. Krispy Kreme was quick to apologize, delete the promotion off Facebook, and launch an internal investigation into the major slip-up. Somebody definitely got fired over this one. Number six, hashtag up for whatever, Budweiser. If I give this to you, are you up for whatever happens next? Uh, As part of their hashtag up for whatever campaign in 2015, Bud Light featured various slogans on their bottles. One, unfortunately, read, quote, the perfect beer for removing no from your vocabulary for the night. Hashtag up for whatever. The label went through at least five layers of approval before it landed on the bottle. According to Vice President of Bud Light Alexander Lambrecht, it was meant to suggest a sense of adventure. However, many people thought it sounded like Bud Light was undermining the concept of consent and promoting sexual assault. In response, Lambrecht admitted that the message had missed the mark and vowed to cease production of that particular label. Number five, total crap, Ratner's Group. In 1991, Gerald Ratner was serving as chairman and CEO of Ratner's Group, a jewelry retailer. The company was incredibly popular in the late 80s and early 90s. That is, until 1991, when Ratner made a speech addressing the Institute of Directors. He called the company's cheap sherry decanter, quote, total crap, and criticized their gold earrings. People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say because it's total crap. While those in attendance laughed at Ratner's jokes, the company's value instantly deflated. Ratner's comments got him fired, nearly bankrupted the company, and forced them to change their name to Signet Group. Some people say, well, that's cheaper than a prawn sandwich from Marks and Spencers. But I have to say, the sandwich will probably last longer than the earrings, but anyway. <laughs> Today, the phrase doing a Ratner is still used whenever a corporate gaffe tarnishes a brand's reputation. Number four, anonymous love letters, Fiat. When you're looking to buy a new car, you're expecting a simple and professional exchange. In the early 90s, however, Fiat broke with that time-honored dynamic and decided to mail anonymous love letters to the demographic of women in Spain they were targeting with their new Cinquecento hatchbacks. These letters were personally addressed, bore no Fiat branding, and adopted the voice and perspective of the car. Characterized as an admirer, the car wrote stuff like, quote, We met again on the street yesterday, and I noticed how you glanced interestedly in my direction. Except, again, there was no context. Just a letter, so naturally, some 50,000 recipients thought they had a stalker. Number three, number fever, Pepsi. 
As an attempt to increase sales in the Philippines, Pepsi held what seemed like a pretty standard numbered bottle cap giveaway, but with a big prize of 1 million pesos, or 40,000 US dollars. The promotion worked wonders, and Pepsi experienced an astronomical rise in sales. Doctor, heard about the number fever? Certain popular numbers, such as 349, were supposed to be eliminated from the grand prize draw. But somewhere the wires got crossed, and 349 was wrongly picked and announced as the winning number. The result? Hundreds of thousands of winners expecting a $40,000 payout. Pepsi backed out of the promise, and riots ensued. Pepsi faced lawsuits, trucks were burned, and people were actually killed. Number 2. Edsel, the Ford Motor Company Ford has made some great vehicles throughout the years. The Edsel was not one of them. A ton of advertising went into the Ford Edsel, as it was the first new Ford brand since the Mercury. This torque is usable power. Another top-selling feature of the Edsel. Founded in 1956, Edsel looked to compete in the mid-budget market alongside the Chrysler Dodge and the GM Pontiac. As it had been 20 years since the Mercury, expectations were high, and Ford pumped upwards of $250 million into production, market research, and advertising. In 2020, that would equate to roughly $2.3 billion. Some will find a home near, others far. But in each, there is inbuilt freedom of movement. However, Edsel was a massive failure, owing to a wide range of circumstances, including a recession and the cars being overhyped and poorly made. It was discontinued just three years after its debut. Want more mojo? Context TV produces original, high-quality videos on business, entrepreneurship, and politics, but from a different point of view. The battle is being fought between Netflix and YouTube. The Federal Reserve should remove all of the current board members who served during the fake account scam. If you want exclusive interviews with industry leaders, in-depth media analysis, and documentaries with a fresh take on the state of business, check out Context TV. Number 1. New Coke, the Coca-Cola Company Coca-Cola is the most popular soft drink in the world, and it's been around since 1886. Well, they're clearly doing something right. Yet in the mid-80s, they decided to go against the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and released New Coke to a largely unresponsive public. Introducing the new taste of Coca-Cola, the best Coca-Cola ever. That's all I'm going to say. In fact, that's all I have to say. At the time, popularity of Coke was waning owing to increased competition. They changed the formula to boost sales, but the result was the exact opposite. Sweeter. Bolder. Better. You're insane. Everyone hated it, sales slumped, and Pepsi gloated, even taking out a full-page ad in the New York Times to declare themselves the winner of the Cola Wars. New Coke lasted just 79 days before the company announced it would be returning to the classic formula. After all, what could 12 little ounces of Pepsi do? Yeah, you're probably right. What could happen? What could happen? Pepsi, the choice of a new generation. So the ones with the problematic names always make me laugh. Like the AIDS diet pill one, it's just really unfortunate because AIDS the disease didn't even exist yet, but anyway. However, the bad planning and bad marketing award, I think, goes to Red Lobster because they really should have known that all you can eat anything is really gonna result in a problematic situation. Anyway, be sure to let us know in the comments which are your favorite marketing fails, or come talk to me on Twitter or Instagram at Rebecca Brayton or on my YouTube channel. See ya.